Marguerite Makes a Book, written by Bruce Robertson, illustrated by Katherine Hewitt. Chapter 1, in which we meet Marguerite, Papa Jacques, the loathsome André, and Master Raymond. In a small house in Paris, nearly 600 years ago, lived a man who made beautiful books. His name was Jacques the Painter but he was affectionately known as Papa Jacques because he was the oldest and most famous book painter in all of Paris. He lived on a street in front of the great cathedral of Notre Dame with all the other people who made and sold books. Papa Jacques's books, called manuscripts, were greatly admired because he painted, or illuminated, each one by hand. He even had made books for the king and queen painting the margins with swans and lilies and brightly colored birds. But Papa Jacques was getting old. His hands sometimes trembled, and he couldn't see as well as he used to. And he was late finishing a prayer book, called a Book of Hours, for his patron, the Lady Isabel. One morning, Papa Jacques's only daughter, Marguerite, rose early to light the fire and prepare Papa's workshop. She set out clean brushes and oyster shells to hold the paints, then carefully placed Papa's most precious possession, his eyeglasses, on the table. She was very nervous, for today was the day Lady Isabella's steward, Andre, would come to check on the progress of the prayer book. As she arranged Papa's work table, Marguerite began to imagine herself dressed in fine clothes and dreamed of riding in a carriage with horses, like Lady Isabel. She had glimpsed the noble lady with the kind face once as she rode by. An impatient knock startled Marguerite out of her daydream. As Papa Jacques slowly made his way to the door, Marguerite prayed that today his hands would not tremble. Is the book ready? André demanded. I'm afraid not, Papa Jacques answered but there's just a little more to do. Well, in three days, Lady Isabel will be celebrating her name day, Andre announced. If it isn't ready by then, he warned, she's not going to pay for it, that I promise, and I'll find someone else who can finish it. Papa Jacques was alarmed. But, but my expenses, my materials, my time, he stammered. Lady Isabel will tell everyone that you are too old to make books, Andre said, and she'll be right, too. With that, he stomped out. Mama Marie stared at the door he had slammed behind him. We don't need his insults or his threats, she said, but we do need the money. Don't worry, Papa, said Marguerite. Let me help you finish the book. There are just a few pictures left, and I know how to do the work. I can do it. Papa Jacques looked at his daughter and shook his head. No, my dear, it's my painting they want. But come with me now on my errands. Where did I leave my list? Marguerite and Papa stepped out into the crowded, noisy street. Marguerite stayed close to her father's side, walking carefully on the slippery cobblestones, ready to catch Papa if he stumbled. They headed toward a large house directly across from the cathedral. There lived the most prosperous bookseller in Paris, Master Raymond de Libraire. I was waiting for you, said Master Raymond. I have those prayers you needed from Chrétien the scribe, he said handing to Jacques a bundle of parchment pages. They were covered with Chrétien's beautiful writing. I hope this time he left enough space for your pictures. Get some more parchment, though, just to be safe. He paused. You know, Lady Isabel is getting anxious for her book. Did she give you the money for my expenses? asked Papa Jacques, a note of desperation in his voice. I'm afraid not. Master Raymond frowned. How are your eyes, Jacques? Marguerite glanced nervously at her father. 
We've come for gold leaf and powdered gold, sir, she said. It's already paid for. Raymond opened a drawer and took out a tidy stack of square pieces of paper. He fanned them open. Gold leaf, the bookseller whispered. It gleams like the sun of heaven above. Marguerite, Papa Jacques said, sounding irritated. It's time we finished our errands. Master Raymond, will you loan me a few francs until the book is finished? I thank you, sir. Papa Jacques took Marguerite's hand and led her outside. Absently, he started to walk into the street. Just at that moment, a horse-drawn cart careened around the corner, directly into Papa Jacques's path, knocking him down. Papa! Marguerite screamed. I'm all right, Marguerite, he said, getting shakily to his feet. But look! he cried. There, between two paving stones, were his glasses, bent and twisted. Chapter 2, in which Marguerite meets many people in different parts of Paris. Half an hour later, Marguerite had gotten Papa back home and settled in his bed. Then, Papa's list in her hand, she set out, alone, to complete his errands. Marguerite crossed a bridge over the River Seine and walked a long way until she came to the edge of the city. There she passed through the city gate and down the road where the countryside began. Here there were no cobblestones to stumble over. Here sheep, goats, and cows were raised. Marguerite entered a gingy shed behind a farmhouse. Inside it smelled very foul. She quickly fished in her pocket for a handkerchief scented with lavender. She held it up to her nose and tried not to breathe. Hello, she called into the shadows. It's Marguerite, Jacques the painter's daughter. A bearded man emerged from a side room. It was Bernard. He was always making jokes that Marguerite didn't find very funny. Come this way, come this way, he said. She followed him into a cleaner room with a window. There she saw, stacked against the walls, rectangular frames as tall as she was. On them were stretched the finest, most beautiful skins of parchment. Spiral-shaped white shavings littered the floor. Just one calfskin, please, she said firmly. Nothing with holes or blemishes. This one, perhaps? Bernard laughed slightly. You seem to know what you want, don't you? Yes, said Marguerite. I do. He cut the sheet from the frame and trimmed it down so that it was an even rectangle. You probably want the scrap edges to practice on, don't you? So you can do your little drawings. Marguerite frowned at the man as he rolled up the skin. Thank you, she said, paid him, and raced out the door. Scraps to practice on, she muttered. Little drawings. She marched up the long, straight street that led back to the gate of the city. Beyond it lay the market. Marguerite pushed her way through the crowds until she found the goose and chicken stall. And what can I help you with, my dear? asked Blanche, a red-faced woman wearing a tattered apron. I need new goose feathers for Papa Jacques' pens and a few eggs, please. Eggs for supper or for mixing paints? For mixing paints. Very well, then, Blanche said. These are a few days old. They'll give you a rich, thick paint. And take one of these, she added, placing a still warm, freshly laid egg in Marguerite's hand. Nice and fresh. Lovely for lunch. Just then, a big goose began to hiss and squawk at Marguerite. She turned with a jump and quickly moved on to a vegetable stall nearby, where she bought fresh green parsley. Then she went to one last stall to buy honey in a little pot. Marguerite crossed the bridge back over the River Seine to her own neighborhood in the shadow of the cathedral. 
The streets were quieter now. She approached a house that seemed to crouch beneath the cathedral's stone gargoyles. As she entered a small room, it took a moment for Marguerite's eyes to adjust to the dim light. There was a peculiar musty smell, like damp spices and moldy straw. Gradually, Marguerite began to see the withered roots and dried flowers that hung from the ceiling. A tiny white-haired woman got up from her chair. Who's there? she asked. The old woman was Ninon the apothecary. She knew everything about herbs and cures. Marguerite loved visiting Ninon. It's me, Marguerite, Jacques the painter's daughter, she said a little loudly. Some days Ninon didn't hear very well. I've come for dried saffron flowers, madder root, a cake of vermilion, some wax, pine pitch, and some lapis lazuli stone. Lapis lazuli stone! Ninon shuffled across to a drawer and pulled out a handful of small, dark blue rocks. These are my last ones, she said softly. To think these came from over mountains and deserts, across rivers. Ninon tucked the roots and stones and everything else into Marguerite's basket. It looks like your father is going to make a very fine book indeed, she said. Then she waved Marguerite away. Chapter 3 Marguerite Sets to Work As soon as she got home, Marguerite lit the fire, set a small pot of water to boil, and unpacked her basket. Then she set to work. The first part was easy. She would need a quill and ink to draw with. She shaped a goose quill with a knife until the end was very sharp yet flexible. Then she scraped some soot off the wall of the fireplace and mixed it with glue in an oyster shell. Soon she had rich black ink. Marguerite started to draw. With swift, delicate strokes, bouquet after bouquet of blooming flowers and nesting birds began to emerge in the margins of the manuscript. Gold leaf came next. In another oyster shell, Marguerite mixed chalk powder, glue, and a drop of honey. Then, in the margins, she carefully dabbed dots of the mixture and let them dry. She slowly picked up a shimmering square of gold leaf, breathed on the dots of glue to warm them, then laid the square over the dots. Where the gold did not stick, she brushed the gold leaf away. Then, with Papa's smooth burnishing stone, she polished the dots of gold leaf to a brilliant shine. Like the sun of heaven above, as Master Raymond had whispered. Now she was ready to make her colors. She began with a very simple yet extremely important step. She broke one of the eggs that Blanche had given her. She separated out the yolk and beat the egg white in a clean bowl until it became foamy. Then she set the bowl aside and let the liquid settle. She would need five colors. Deep red, yellow, green, bright red, and blue. First, Marguerite put the red roots of the matter plant into the pot of water that was now boiling. The water immediately turned a deep, dark red. The same red, she always thought, as the stained glass windows of Notre Dame. She added egg white to the red liquid to make a paint that flowed easily off her brush. Green came next. She crushed a handful of fresh parsley until a deep green juice came out. This, too, she mixed with the egg white to create paint that was just thick enough. Now for yellow, which came from dried saffron flowers. She placed the crushed flowers in a little cloth bag and laid the bag in a small dish of egg white. The yellow color seeped out of the bag into the egg white, making a nice thin paint. Then bright red. 
Using the mortar and pestle, Marguerite broke up a cake of vermilion, grinding it into powder. As before, she mixed the powder with the egg. Finally, the most beautiful of all, blue. She made a ball from wax and pine pitch, into which she mixed the crushed up, powdered lapis lazuli. Dropping the ball into a bowl of warm water, she stirred gently and watched very closely. Almost like magic, the finest, bluest particles of the lapis lazuli slowly began to emerge from the ball, turning the water blue. Marguerite waited for the blue particles to settle to the bottom of the bowl. Then she carefully poured off the clear water. There, at the bottom, was pure blue. When mixed with some egg white, the paint was the color of the Virgin Mary's robe, the color of heaven itself. Now Marguerite was ready to paint. She started by painting the flowers in the margins of the parchment page. She smiled to herself as she decided to make the flowers her flowers, the daisies known as Marguerite's. Using the dried saffron flower mixture, she painted the centers of the daisies bright yellow. Around the edges of the white petals, she painted yellow shades. Using the crushed parsley mixture, she painted the leaves and stems of the marguerite's bright green. She leaned back to look at her work. The petals and leaves looked as though they were twisting and bending in the wind. She was pleased. Marguerite had drawn nesting birds in the margins. Now, using the precious lapis lazuli, she began to fill in their outlines in brilliant blue. The afternoon was beginning to slip away, and Marguerite had to squint slightly in the changing light. No wonder Papa needs glasses, she thought, brushing back a strand of hair that had fallen into her eyes. Her hands made exact delicate movements over the page. She was so absorbed in her work that she didn't even notice when her cat, Gabrielle, jumped onto the table behind her and began to play with the string. But what she wanted to do most of all was to complete the portrait of the Lady Isabel that Papa had already begun. In black ink, he had drawn the outline of a lady kneeling before a prayer book. Marguerite painstakingly began to fill in Papa's drawing, beginning with Lady Isabel's robe. She decided it would be a bright vermilion red, like the dress she had once seen the noble lady wear. Using the much darker red from the crushed matter root, she painted in the shadows of the folds of the beautiful dress and the brocade designs on the gown. As a finishing touch, she traced fine gold lines around the folds of the dress, making them sparkle in the light, just as Papa did. Suddenly, Marguerite heard someone at the door. She glanced outside the window and was startled to see that dusk was beginning to fall. How many hours had passed since she had started painting? Then she heard a booming voice. It was Andre. Chapter 4. A Surprise The door opened and an unhappy-looking Papa and a smug Andre walked into the workroom. Marguerite, what is this? Papa asked. Just as she was about to speak, a finely dressed noblewoman entered the room. Marguerite recognized her at once. It was the Lady Isabel! Papa Jacques looked at his workbench and saw all the finished pages drying. He looked nervously at his patron. But to his surprise, the noble lady smiled. Lady Isabel studied the painted pages, lingering over one page in particular. It was an image of herself in a beautiful red robe with golden hair like that of an angel, surrounded by a border of marguerite daisies. These are my favorite flowers, she said, clearly delighted. What was Andre so worried about? At these words, Andre's face fell. When the pages are in their velvet covers, nothing will be more beautiful. 
Amazed, Papa Jacques looked at his daughter, his eyes fixed on her beaming face. You have done well, Master Jacques, and I am very pleased, Lady Isabel said. And who is this lovely young lady with a brush in her hand? Why, this is my most talented assistant, Papa Jacques announced with pride. My daughter, Marguerite. Well, if she helped you with this book, then she does you very proud, Master Jacques, Lady Isabel said. She started to leave, then stopped and turned around. I think I know who added those daisies. She swept from the room, Andre trailing miserably at her heels. And with that, Papa's and Marguerite's work was sold to the noble Lady Isabel, and Papa kept his reputation as the finest painter of illuminated manuscripts in all of Paris, with the finest apprentice. A note to the reader. Among the treasures of the J. Paul Getty Museum is a rare collection of European illuminated manuscripts. Marguerite Makes a Book was inspired by a group of Parisian manuscripts in the Getty Museum's collection that date from around 1400 to 1425, a golden era in the history of French painting. Marguerite, the French word for daisy, was a popular name among women in medieval France. One of the Getty's Parisian manuscripts was commissioned by a wealthy woman named Marguerite, whose portrait appears on one of its pages, surrounded by a border of daisies. Indeed, it was the presence of the Marguerites that provided a clue to her identity, and the heroine of this story is named in her honor. The End